Hell Week 2001. My hometown, Amarillo, Texas, had two high schools and a really intense rivalry. The buildup to homecoming was chaos. Eggs, toilet paper, paintball guns, seven days of teenage mayhem. Like if John Hughes directed The Purge. <laughs> An illegal exorcism of adolescent angst under the guise of school spirit. It was tradition. We'd suit up in black clothes and camo and meet at parks on both sides of town. It was war. There were teams and strategies and adrenaline. It was fun. Maybe too fun. The worst kids were the best at Hell Week, and my friends and I were maniacs. School skipping, drug using, law breaking, troublemakers. We reveled in the anarchy. Finding ways to bulk up on supplies despite stores cracking down. Parents were on code red and cops were everywhere. But we spent a lot of our teenage years figuring out how to trick adults and evade the police. Every weekend of partying was a test. And Hell Week was the Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> I enjoyed the three out of four years that I participated. But after I dropped out of high school a month into my senior year, school spirit wasn't exactly a priority anymore. I was too busy dealing with mental illness and addiction to worry about staying connected to my peers. But still, not participating in Hell Week was weird. Not as weird as being in the audience watching my class graduate later that year, but still pretty weird. So on the last night of what would have been my final Hell Week, the eve of the dance and the big game, I decided to instead get really high, drive around, and listen to music. My tradition. I had avoided all of the battlegrounds until I ran out of cigarettes and got thirsty. There was a discount store a mile or so away from Austin Park that was cheap, friendly, and didn't ID. I got my usual, a large peach tea and a pack of American spirits and parked in the far corner of the lot. I lit a smoke, took a sip, and then almost had a heart attack when someone ran up out of nowhere and started banging on my window. After I got my breath back, I recognized my friend Clay, his friend Jason, and Jason's little brother, who was a couple years younger than us, all decked out in paint and egg-covered fatigues. The fact that Clay and Jason had graduated a year before and were still super into Hell Week says a lot about them. I could immediately tell something was wrong. I rolled down my window. Before I could say anything, Clay was yelling, let us in, let us in. I unlocked the doors and they fell inside. Go, 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 go. He barked and I started driving. I had tried to get away from Hell Week, but it found me. I was instantly back in war mode, ready for whatever. This is what it was, the excitement of camaraderie, purpose, and danger. I thought that not participating was the right thing to do, but I felt so lonely sitting by myself in that empty parking lot, knowing the fun that everyone was having. Where am I going? I asked, pulling giant drags off my cigarette. I wasn't alone anymore. Olsen Park, that's where the guys who beat up my little brother are gonna be, Jason said from the back seat. I turned to see him leaned into his brother who had a fresh black eye, bloody nose, and a fat lip. I was still stoned, but sobering up quick as I sped out of the parking lot. Clay was electric, bouncing up and down in the front seat. We were at Austin Park, and these guys jumped Jason's little brother. The story was missing important details, but in the madness of the moment, it made sense. In retrospect, I should have had a lot more questions. Who are these guys? Why did they jump him? How do you know they're going to be at Olsen Park? And most importantly, what are you going to do when we get there? But at the time, I just drove. After I dropped out, I felt so far away from everything. My friends, my understanding of where I fit socially, myself. So being back in that headspace where I was a part of something and on a team and connected again, I wasn't thinking about questions. If I had, I might have been paying closer attention and noticed the metal baseball bat Jason was hiding under his feet. We approached the park fast, and there were at least a dozen other cars lining the street in a full-blown melee of flying eggs and paintballs happening all around us. From inside the car, it was silent. 
the volume cranked up when the doors opened and Clay, Jason, and his little brother jumped out of my car and I saw the bat. As much as I'd sobered up, the weed that was still in my system cast a fog of confusion and fear over the next 30 seconds. I heard glass shattering, metal folding, and then a similar sound, but one I couldn't immediately identify. I scanned the scene, seeing the wake of Jason's rage, broken windshields and mirrors, dented hoods and doors, people lunging at him to get him to quit hitting their cars, and then my bloodshot eyes followed the unfamiliar echo. It was definitely the bat, but it wasn't hitting glass or metal anymore. It's more of a muted thud and then a wet crunch as I watched for what couldn't have been longer than a few seconds, Jason hitting people with the bat. It was quick but brutal. I closed my eyes as soon as I realized what I was seeing, but the terror played out on the insides of my eyelids. Bones disconnecting, breaking skin, blood shooting out in time with heartbeats. The muffled air bursts of the paintball gunfire stopped. The cracking of eggshells died down. Laughter turned to gasps. I shifted into reverse and slammed on the gas, one of my doors still open. I jerked the wheel quick to head the other way, and the force pushed the door back as far as it could go, but then slammed it shut when I finished the turn. I looked in my rearview mirror, and it was a blur. I couldn't make out any faces or movements, but even if I'd been closer and it had been clearer, it still wouldn't have made sense. I just wanted to escape, go back into that hole I dug for myself, the lonely parking lot inside my mind, a sad but safe place where this bullshit would disappear. And so I did. And with my head in the sand, the events of that night and what Jason did slowly went away until they came back. Months later, Clay and I, along with a couple friends, were returning from a road trip. Clay had been mad at me for leaving him at Olsen Park, but he understood. He was mad at Jason too. He wanted to get away from it as well. We couldn't stand Amarillo and left as often as we could, almost on a weekly basis. So when Clay took the wrong way back home and then stubbornly insisted it was faster, which it wasn't, we all settled in for some extra travel time. About 30 minutes later, my mom called and was furious. Can you tell me why two policemen just came to the house? My stomach dropped and I froze. They said something about a lawsuit, property damage, life-threatening injuries, someone gave them your license plate number, said that you had something to do with it, you better tell me what's going on as soon as you get home. Oh, okay, okay, I will, I'm sorry, everything's fine, I promise but she hung up before I could finish. Clay's mom called him a few minutes later. We were scared, but also relieved. If he hadn't gone the wrong way, we would have been home when the cops showed up and wouldn't have had time to get our story straight. Look, I didn't condone what Jason did. I was horrified by it. But when I was a teenager, we hated authority and had an allegiance to each other that transcended right and wrong. We were all partners in crime, literally. Drug deals and house parties where lying to adults and eluding police was absolutely necessary. Establishing a bond that blurred reason and created a gray, smoky fog of loyalty over morality to protect ourselves and each other no matter what. I was told to go to the police station first thing the next morning and give a statement for their records and the lawyers. On the way, I had a massive anxiety attack. I had run-ins with the police over the years, been pulled over, parties busted. I even sat in the back of a cop car once, but I'd never been inside a police station. That morning, I had to pull over and throw up out of the open door of my car multiple times before arriving steadying myself with a handful of Xanax and walking in casually enough not to seem incredibly guilty. The cop was a cop, stern, gruff, mustached. He turned on his tape recorder and started grilling me immediately. Where were you that night? Who were you with? What did you see? But I knew my lines. I was at the park 
There were a ton of other kids there. I saw Hell Week. He pushed back. Yeah, well, the kids of the parents filing the lawsuit said that you fled the scene. I was ready for this. Well, yeah, when things got out of hand, I left. I don't want to have anything to do with that kind of stuff. It was horrible. Now, this part was true, and he felt it. All right, son, now just tell me what happened. I took a deep breath. We were all at Austin Park, and then someone said there was something going on at Olson. So a bunch of people piled into my car. When we got there, it was so chaotic, and as soon as I saw the guy with the bat going crazy, I bailed. That's what happened. He didn't take his eyes off mine, but he motioned to his notes. I have multiple statements saying the suspect was in your vehicle. After another gulp of air, well, maybe he was. I, I honestly don't know. Everyone from Austin Park got to Olsen at the same time, and all I could see was the back of people's heads, and like I said, I left immediately. He flipped through his notes and challenged me. So you're admitting that the perpetrator was in your car. I said, no, he might have been in my car. Okay, yeah, and you would expect me to believe that you had no idea who it was? No clue? Give me the names of everyone you saw that night. Look, I honestly don't remember. They were all wearing masks and face paint. It's hell week. I've spent the last few months trying to forget about everything that happened that night, okay? I hate that this happened. I didn't even want to be involved in Hell Week this year, but I was, and I wish I could help, but I can't. He studied me for a minute, registering the reality of what I was saying and weighing it against what I wasn't. Now, you better be sure I'm not going to find out you're lying to me right now. This is your last chance, and I suggest you take it. All I had to do was commit, and I did. He said, all right, but I need you to write and sign your official statement and take care of a few legal requirements before I can allow you to leave. I wrote everything out and put my signature at the bottom thinking that would be it, but it wasn't. Next thing I knew, I was getting my picture taken. I hadn't been arrested for anything, but the lawyers wanted them for their records. It felt like mug shots. It felt dirty. I started to panic again, but kept it together long enough for him to also get my fingerprints. Again, this felt awful. I still think he did it just to fuck with me, and it worked. I just wanted to leave so I could get as far away as possible and throw up again, and I did. But before I left, he stopped me and leaned in close. These families are very serious about getting to the bottom of this. This caused thousands of dollars in damages, and that's just to the vehicles. The medical bills are a different story. Some of the kids were athletes with scholarships, and their injuries are putting their college careers in jeopardy, and one of them might suffer permanent physical damage. We will definitely be in touch because this is not over. But it was. I never heard a single thing about this again after I left the police station. Not from my parents, my friends, or even as gossip. It just bled back into the ether. This was hell week. Bedlam. Kids jumping in and out of cars, speeding all over town, destroying property and injuring each other in the name of a high school rivalry that a lot of the participants didn't even care about. It was a reason for all the good kids to be bad and the bad kids to go crazy. And in this case, an excuse for us to hide behind. We'd gotten out of much worse. This wasn't a traffic stop with an ounce of weed in the glove box or a busted kegger. But this was one of the things I truly regret getting away with. The guilt and shame that comes with abandoning my conscience in lieu of some ridiculous sense of devotion to people I don't even know anymore and never really did. I wish I'd turned Jason in. I hope they caught him. There must have been at least a dozen, a dozen other kids brought in for questioning. One of them must have been a better person than I was and did the right thing. My punishment is not being able to get that scene out of my head. Whenever I remember the lies I told and the stupid reasons I told them, I have to think of that violence, the bat and the damage done, the glass, metal, and bone breaking, skin ripping, blood spraying, lives changing, the noises and images that made the fantasy world of Hell Week far too real. And when, for a moment, 
it actually felt like hell. Thank you.